Right, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk very generally. So much of what I say, I think, would apply equally well to any type of trial. It's not specific to Twix. There are a few places where I will uh, refer to Twix, but I'm thinking generally. So I'm wanting us to think, if we're thinking about Twix as we are, think about inefficiency and the problems that that may cause us. <laughs> and also to extend it a little bit into this idea of ethics. I am not a bioethicist. I'm a trial methodologist. Okay, so that's my background. Now every year, around about the 20th of May, there's something called International Clinical Trials Day. And this year, I saw a series of tweets that were essentially a person making a statement. So it was a series of things talking about why trials are good. And this one is from Howell Williams who's the director of the UK's Health Technology Assessment Program. And he said, look, trials are right at the heart of the primary research that we use to inform decision-making in the National Health Service. They are central. Trials change lives. They're really important. And he's, he's absolutely right. They're important because these trials are hoovered up by systematic reviewers and guideline producers to change the way care is delivered, not only here, of course, in the UK, but around the world. And that care is delivered to millions of people around the world. It is really, really important what comes out of trials. They do change people's lives. Any healthcare system that considers itself to be an evidence-based or evidence-informed healthcare system uses trials because they're the backbone as Hal said. And that then makes it really quite strange that the way we, people like me, methodologists, people who design trials and think about how we're going to run trials, how we're going to disseminate the results of those trials, it makes it strange that the evidence base that we have to make our decisions is often extremely thin. So this quote I use a lot from somebody called Monica Shah. She and her colleagues were looking at site selection in multi-center trials, cardiovascular trials. And she made this observation, which I think is spot on. Essentially, isn't it strange that this thing, the trial that is so important to evidence-based medicine, the way we do them is not evidence-based to a very large extent. We use judgment. We use what we think works because it seemed to work okay last time. We use experience. And we do that very often because we have no alternative. And I'll highlight some aspects of that in a moment. So we are forced to do a lot of judgment-based decision-making, which sometimes will be OK, sometimes maybe far less than OK. And we are not really systematically developing tracts of evidence to fill those gaps. So this is, and again, I'll highlight this to get a little bit later. This is not a new problem. This is a many decades old problem. So Monica Shah, absolutely spot on. We have something which is very important for an evidence-based healthcare system. And yet, we ourselves, the people who are in the thick of it with regard to the design, the conduct, analysis, the reporting, we ourselves often have next to no evidence upon which to base our decision making, and we are often not doing too much to change that. Now, we do have an initiative which we're just getting off the ground, which we lead from Aberdeen, called Trial Forge, which is trying to at least attempt to fill some of these gaps collaboratively and in a coordinated way. And what we are wanting to do with this is think about a trial as a pathway. From over here, we might have a research question, and then over here, we end up right at the end with dissemination of those trial results. And what we're interested in is how do we know, what do we know about the most effective way to carry out that particular process? And often, the answer to that is we don't know very much at all. So if we start with a research question, this is a really nice paper to highlight some problems linked to research questions. So it's by uh, somebody called Celine Habre and colleagues, and they asked a really nice question. They were involved in a systematic review a decade or so before this paper was published. And it looked at an analgesic. 
that was used for a particular procedure. So there's a little procedure done, and it was an analgesic that made that procedure less painful. And the review asked, what analgesic should we use? They found 50-odd trials, and there was a clear winner. I think it's called lignocaine. Some, I'm not a medic. Lidocaine, some drug, if it is indeed a drug. <laughs> but they found a clear winner. It was effective. It was cheap. It was easy to use. So what they concluded in that review from a decade earlier was, look, if there are to be future trials, those trials to be relevant to people making decisions as to which analgesic should I use, those trials should compare whatever the new whizzy thing is to this lidocaine, lignocaine, or whatever it was. If it's not compared to that, who cares? Because that's the question that people have. Now, if we fast forward a decade, they rerun that review. And they find 136 new trials in this area of healthcare, looking at new analgesics, or analgesics, a bit more correct, analgesics, for this particular procedure. And what they found of those 136 was that 87 of them they categorize as clinically irrelevant because of their choice of comparator. So you'd look at those trial results, and then if you were thinking, what analgesic should I use, you would look at the result and say, yeah, but I wonder how it compares to lignocaine, or whatever it was called. So this bunch of trials, because of its choice of comparator, have, have been rendered essentially clinically irrelevant. So the, the research question that those trials had has, at the piece of paper stage, when the trial was at this stage, was fatally wounded. Years might have passed, the trial was done, result comes out, nobody cares. That is a massive source of inefficiency, clearly. Massive source of waste. And the point is that that is ethically unacceptable by anybody's standards. A whole raft of research done that nobody cares about. I don't know how many people in here, people, participants are involved. It would be possible to find out if I could remember, but a lot. All those people gave their time, their goodwill, possibly expecting some benefit to themselves. Hopefully they thought they were going to give something to the wider world. Staff were involved, money was involved, money that could have been used on something else. Massive waste, ethical problem. Let's keep going. This is a quote um, an article by Ian Chalmers and colleagues from a series in The Lancet about research waste. They highlight a survey that was done asking trialists about their knowledge of relevant systematic reviews prior to starting their trial. And what it says here, fewer than half were even aware of the existence so it wasn't that they didn't, they didn't consult them, they just didn't know they existed. So these fewer than half people, they actually used existing evidence, but the majority designed their trial in ignorance of relevant research. Research that leads you into designing a trial with a comparator, for example, that renders your trial result in five years' time of no interest, because it is not the comparator that those people for whom you think you're designing the trial are looking. They're not looking for what you've done, they're looking for something else. And had these people looked to the existing evidence, well then maybe they wouldn't have fallen into that hole. This is a slide, I also like using this one a lot. This guy here, many of you will know him, it's a medical statistician, Doug Altman. And he's at a research waste conference in Edinburgh from a few years ago. And he's got this slide up here, it's about a review. Review question was, is P53-3 a prognostic marker for bladder cancer? Now, that, though, that review team found 168 studies involving more than 10,000 people. They were done over 10 years. The review authors concluded, we have no idea whether P53 is a prognostic marker. 168 studies, more than 10,000 people. An enormous inefficiency, but also an enormous <coughs> ethical issue that you could have 168 studies, relevant 
to this question, but which together were unable to reduce the uncertainty as to whether P53 is a prognostic marker. Almost certainly because the design of a lot of these studies was poor. The quality of the study was poor. We'd have no confidence or little confidence in whatever they say. Again, this lack of quality in the research endeavor is a massive ethical problem. It's inefficient, but it's an ethical problem too. Merrick talked about this group. These are Schwartz and Lelouch. As I said a moment ago, this is not a new profound revelation that has come to us now. This is from 50 years ago. And essentially what they're saying is that from the very beginning, many trials are stuffed. And they are stuffed because they make poor quality decisions with regard to their choice of outcome or comparator. The interventions perhaps they're looking at, the people they involve in those trials. And by doing so, they design a trial that is not relevant to those individuals whose decisions they are trying to inform. So the whole endeavor is a waste of time. It's a waste of resource, goodwill. People who could be involved in something more useful are put into trials that have no use at all. And often, as Merrick suggested, this mistake is, is almost accidental. They accidentally, by a poor thought process, design the wrong trial. And they just fall into this trap. Now, again, Merrick mentioned this wheel in his talk. This is Kirsty Loudon, so she's the PhD student that we had. And when she was setting up her work, she did not want to enable, allow people to fall into this trap without knowing they were about to fall into the trap. So she wants people to ask, who am I designing my trial for? What do they want? What do they need? So that their decision is going to be a little bit more informed than it would otherwise be. And that's what should be driving my design decisions. Who is it who I want to use these results? Because if I don't pay attention to what they want and what they need, clearly what has gone before, then I'm wasting their time, resources, et cetera, et cetera. And we have this wheel. And the key point with this wheel is to try and align what you think you are doing with your design decision making. So at the end of this process, you might be raising your own eyebrows at the type of design that you are thinking of using given what you are trying to achieve with that particular trial. And that's the point of that wheel. How do my design decisions match what I'm trying to do? To so try and avoid developing a trial that nobody cares about in a way that is avoidable. Let's think about some processes. Now, Twix has been, it's been mentioned a few times about this potential advantage that Twix had, or indeed actual advantage, that Twix has with regard to recruitment. Recruitment is terrifying with regard to many trials. Lots and lots and lots of trials struggle here. This is a, a graph from one of my own trials from years ago, and it highlights a very common set or pair of curves. One is projected or expected recruitment, and the other one is actual. And at some point, they very often diverge, never to return. And sometimes this point of diversion is here, right at the start. It's a very, very common graph. There is a t and I heard somebody was from Bristol. There is a group in Bristol that are very good at making these graphs converge from the beginning. They, they have an approach which is impressive. But this is very common. And one of the reasons I think this is common is because we have not systematically developed evidence to help people develop evidence-based recruitment strategies, or strategies that they might reasonably expect to be effective. Now, there are about, because somebody has looked at this, about 25,000 or so new trial publications every year. And essentially, they all have to recruit real people. Now, given that there are 25,000 a year, I think the Cochrane Register of Trials has just shy of a million trials in it. There are a lot of trials. And it's a shame that we're not better at recruitment, given how much of it we are trying to do. 
Now, if you were designing a trial and you wanted to choose an evidence-based or components for an evidence-based, evidence-informed recruitment strategy, you might think that people like me had been beavering away for decades to provide you with interventions that you could use. So this is a Cochrane review that I lead together with a whole crowd of other people. And we have looked for things that people could use to improve their recruitment strategies. And if we are kind, there are three things that we have managed to evaluate, and we can say hand on heart, if you do these things, we would anticipate your recruitment to be improved. And this is three things since the beginning of time. <laughs> 25,000 trials published, give or take, in the next calendar year. All of them, more or less, going to have to recruit. And there are three things for which we have decent quality evidence that mine improve, is likely to improve your recruitment. And actually, two of them you can't widely apply. And I'll tell you what the third is a little bit later on. This has a cost. This is an ethical issue, it's a resource issue. <coughs> Resources could be used in different ways, of course. This is a great study from the States. It's an ac one academic medical center. They asked themselves, how much money do we spend on trials that fail to recruit? So they looked for trials that were shut down because of a failure to recruit. And they defined those trials as trials that recruited zero or one participant before being shut down. So they were pretty clear failures with regard to recruitment. They found over a five-year period 260 trials in that category. And then they figured out, OK, how much did we spend on ethics? How do, much did we spend on contract negotiations? How much did we spend on site setup? Did that for the 260, and it was just shy of a million dollars. So that's a million dollars effectively piled up and poof, torched. Because all of those trials, all 260 of them, essentially recruited no more, at absolute best, 260 people amongst them, probably less than that. And yet, there was this vast quantity of money spent achieving nothing because they went through all the steps. One reason is, I think, poor design. So strategies that were developed that really had little or no chance of success, which is why the Bristol group are particularly good. They have a, an approach with Jenny Donovan where you start to tease out what might work, what might not work before you bulldoze ahead and try something out anyway. Uh, but also, we do not offer trialists uh, a sort of collection of components that they could put into their recruitment strategies for which we have decent quality evidence. So multiply this by however many centers <laughs> there are world, around the world doing it, and it's an enormous spend that is not achieving very much at all. This is that one thing of those three things that I mentioned. So if we think this is the pinnacle, of our recruitment evidence with regards to that Cochrane review right now, and it is this. If you have invited by post a potential participant to take part in your trial and that individual has not responded, why don't you phone that person up? That is the best evidence-based intervention we have right now for a trial in that Cochrane review. The best estimate of the size of benefit is about 6%. Bit of an uncertainty, confidence interval, three to nine. So small benefit. There are some other issues around the evidence behind this, but the, the trials that evaluated it were both very good. So it's high quality evidence, um, but it's for trials which had a very, very poor recruitment rate to start with. So single figure recruitment. And that, this is as good as it gets so far with regard to evidence-based recruitment interventions. Now the reason I put it up, apart from to highlight just how thin evidence is for an absolutely crucial part of essentially every single trial, is that this evidence-based intervention often struggles to be approved. If you, tried, if you try to build this into your recruitment strategy, it often gets thrown back because it's considered to be cold calling. Now, none of these participants have agreed to take part in your trial yet, and yet we're phoning them up. So people reject it or ethical committees often reject it as cold calling. Uh, so my personal experience is that we have put this into trials and ethics committees have been completely reasonable with regard to incorporating this because we have argued our case on the basis of the risk to the trial of not recruiting. So those ethics committees have considered not only what is a legitimate 
issue here. We are cold calling. There is no doubt about that. None of these people have consented to have me phone them up. So there is an issue, but the committees have weighed that against the risk to the trial of not recruiting. And at least in the trials I've been involved with, it has been approved. And I guess my suggestion would be that it, we, make, we start to make those sorts of arguments more often. Think about Twix. It's a design, we've, we've heard this already today, it's a design that is unfamiliar to many. And uh, I think we heard that the design was approved. It took a couple of attempts, but it was approved. They wanted resubmissions and changes made, but it was approved. It's unfamiliar. And that unfamiliarity leads to difficulties for those people tasked with making decisions about whether this is ethically acceptable or not. So I think that requires us, as with any other um, ethical, or sorry, ethical, any other innovation, to make our case for what we are trying to do. So we can't assume um, that the committee is against us, I don't think. We need to make our case. And we need to balance, and as does the ethics committee, balance the risk that the design might pose. So we've had a lot of discussion about consent. Much of that discussion, I think, applies to any consent process. There are clear differences between the consent process that we've talked about here, particularly that pre-randomization idea of consent. But what we have to do, and what we need the ethics committees to do, is to consider the risks, the ethical problems of failure against what are real ethical questions and certainty linked to the design. So we've had a lot of discussion about the consent process, and there are clearly legitimate arguments in different directions. So I don't think there's any, we can't deny that. The point I'm making is that efficiency means that it may well be the only way to do a particular trial, or it may well be clearly the most efficient way of doing a trial by a long way. We might be able to do several trials, whereas previously we might only have ever had a hope of doing a single trial. So that is the argument that is made. It is not to deny that there are potential problems here, but that there are clearly problems with not doing this as well. And that what we want the committee or indeed others to make a decision about is how do those benefits and harms of using it versus not using it weigh up? And again, in my experience, I've never tried a Twix, so I've, I've, not, I've never been involved in a Twix. But my experience is that that argument, I have had um, great success from reasonable ethics committees in arguing a case for things which others have struggled with. And I don't think it's because I'm doing it differently. It's that I argue it explicitly on efficiency and evidence. So we have an evidence-based approach to recruitment here. It's one of very few. If we don't use it, there's a risk to recruitment, which is real. Um, this is the downside, this is the plus side. What do you think? My experience is that ethics committees are engaged with that, particularly if you turn up face to face, which also I think is a good idea if you get the opportunity. So, good on time. I think inefficiency is widespread, but is also an ethical problem. So the fact that in that study that I mentioned by Celine Habre, that though there were 87 of 136 studies that actually managed to run to completion and then, every, well, they concluded that they're clinically irrelevant. The comparator is such that it is clinically irrelevant. It, that strikes me as a massive ethical failing somewhere in the system. Some of those trials were placebo. There was clearly an effective, cheap, easy to use intervention, which half of the participants in those trials were denied. How that managed to get to be approved is surprising to me. It's clearly an ethical issue. There's inefficiency, but there are ethical issues there too. I think it wastes inefficiency, wastes a lot of participant goodwill. People go into trials, I think, with, with all the best of intentions. They, I, I think we should accept that people go into trials hoping for some personal benefit. I, I, I think that's a fairly established Fact. People hope, might not expect, but hope for some personal benefit. And then there's also altruism on top and a whole raft of other things. But by doing these sorts of studies that are highly inefficient, 
that are not going to improve people's decision making or are very flabby in that they take a long, long time to do something because we hadn't really thought through our design well. But that wastes people's time, goodwill. It affects their experience of taking part in research. And it, it affects the trust that people have in the research process, I think. And we sh it reduces the opportunity of future work with those individuals. It wastes <coughs> staff time. So clinicians, in my experience, uh, are, are enthusiastic to an extent about research, but they have other priorities. If we make their lives hard, well, we're wasting their time. Uh, and we need to think carefully about that. And each of these design choices that we have when making our trials, putting our trials together, such as the Twix approach, how are we going to do the consent? How are we going to work through our data collection? What are the outcomes that we are going to measure? Those sorts of decisions are very, very important linked to efficiency. And they can make or break a trial very early in its lifespan. And you can render yourself involved in an endeavor that could last years, for which at the end of it, nobody cares. And none of us want to be in that situation. And then this just final point is that all of us, if we find ourselves on ethics committees or working with approvals processes, that I think it's good to be thoughtful about the ethical justification for certainly doing something. What are the problems that might be associated? What are the advantages of this process? Uh, but also, what are the potential problems for not doing something? And I think, and I can't remember who it was, somebody had a slide which said much the same sort of thing. We need to think about the way that some of these ethical decisions or concerns that are raised about the Twix design may actually be doing harm because it's the only way of answering a particular research question. So I think that's what we all should be thinking about. And certainly we're putting forward our arguments to, into the approvals process. I would explicitly think in this way, that we need to point out to people that there are harms with not doing something. There are issues we can think of with doing it, there are also potential issues with not doing it. It's a considered judgment. That's it. Thank you very much. It was interesting to see, and uh, it just makes me think of the marriage between the trials and cohorts, right? Because I think the, uh, with what's happening in Twix, it's also a mixture of professionals, people who do cohort research. Uh, because uh, that's typically where there's most expertise on both how to keep individuals in a study, but also on why it is important to be to, to keep the groups complete and representative. Uh, you only showed the tip of the iceberg, like the, the trials that didn't recruit anyone at all. And I wonder about all the trials that uh, recruited small or unrepresentative samples, because it, in addition to the risk of not providing an answer, there's the risk of providing the wrong right. answer. Absolutely right. yeah. And I have recently exchanged the experience on this with the, with the PIs of the Dunedin Health Cohort. And they've been able to make to retain 95, 96, 97% of participants on, in assessments up to, up to age around 40. And, um, we, we discussed this, and uh, they said we actually spent as much resources and money to get in the last 20% as we get to get in the first 80%. But it's worth it, because the, the last 20% uh, have the majority of participants that experience multiple adverse outcomes. They are, they are the most informative part of the whole. Yeah. And I, I, I think, you know, issues like this, I, don't have, I haven't seen them looked at in, in a randomized control trial literature, but in the last, uh, you know, the last discussion we had, uh, Kim said, you know, losing 15%, it's not bad. It's considered good on, on trials. There's actually um, a colleague of mine who, is, who talks a lot re uh, about something called the fragility index. I don't know if people have heard that. Um, uh, Kay Walsh is the person who's the first author of a paper I'm thinking of. But what that group say is that actually, um, and this works for, I think it's dichotomous outcomes, so dead or alive. And I think it's fair to say, that perhaps largely driven by the Cochrane uh, handbook, is that we 
tended to think that if we had 80% uh, or more of our randomized population there at the end, uh, we, were, we were not too bad. So it could be a loss of 15% and we'd think, okay, we're not too bad. Um, what Walsh uh, and colleagues have done with this thing called the fragility index is um, highlight the fact that actually the, the, the fragility of the conclusion, so let's say it's, um, it's in favor of the intervention is such that actually for many trials, the number that, that you could swing the result in the opposite direction, so no, this is not beneficial, it's actually not harmful, um, by the no if, if the number of people who you don't have, you've lost, actually had an event that went against the intervention. So the, that, you know, if they all had a bad outcome, your trial, which now looks effective, actually is rendered harmful. And that's how fragile a lot of trials are. It only, it only works with dichotomous outcomes. So I'm told there's one for continuous outcomes. But their, their end point is we're actually a bit too complacent with regard to that loss to follow up. We, we routinely accept about 20%. Actually, for some, it is much, much less than that that we can tolerate. But this is just we... loss to follow up. What about the huge uh, drop it's between the... number of eligible individuals? And the number of... Uh, absolutely right. There's a, a sort of pyramid, and we, we end up with this highly selected group of individuals, uh, people who are not eligible, uh, we've not managed to screen or whatever, they've dropped out. So I agree. I, I, I mean, these are the points that Merrick and others have been making, that there is a, an approach to trials that has been extremely constrained. And what you end up with, a result in a population with uh, professionals and um, medical centers, that actually do not bear too much comparison with what's out there, and yet the conclusions of that trial will be applied to, to what's out there, and that that is something that should give us pause, and that we should start to look at that sort of funnel and look to see how we can make our trial look a bit more like <coughs> routine world, if that is what we're setting out to do. So some trials may well be working in that constrained world, and that's appropriate. But if they're trying to directly inform a clinical decision or a policymaker decision, then that is not where they want to be. And yet, by accident almost, that is where they find themselves. All right. I, do we have time for one more question or are we wrapping up? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, Danny Allen, uh, Sheffield Clinical Science Unit. Um, thanks for that. You certainly encouraged me to have another go with the telephone reminders because I've been rejected twice by ethics committees for trying that mm -hmm. and uh, whilst I'm absolutely sure I didn't put the case cogently enough for it and um, you've given me ammunition for that. Um, at least one of the ethics committees was very explicit about their duty being about um, an ethical duty, sort of individual beneficence over the public good. Yeah, so they don't see it as their problem yeah. to help us um, sort of allocate resources efficiently. Mm -hmm which is what your argument yeah, is. Yeah, now, so it's great to know that there are ethics committees who yeah. are capable of thinking mm -hmm. otherwise, because I can tell you at least one that isn't. No. Uh, and it would be useful to know who your recs are. Who? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rex well, that, the one I'm thinking of is Tayside, uh, in that case. Um, Bristol, interestingly, not, not on this question, but I found them to be receptive to argument. So uh, in a particular study just last year, in fact, um, they, I did not, for a variety of reasons, uh, could not give potential participants the, the normal 24-hour window. Um, so, and I said that in my proposal, and the committee said back, came back and said, <coughs> you have to do it. So I outlined my arguments for why I was not going to do it, and then made that case. And essentially was saying, that here's my evidence, give me yours. And they approved it straight away. It was not a problem. <laughs> so... I, um, so I've, I've found them reasonable, which is not to say that they always come back and say, just get on with it, but that they've been receptive to an argument along the lines of, here is my evidence for why I want to take this approach. Please give me yours, and then we can have a discussion. And at least the ones I've approached, uh, which have generally been Tayside, and in that one case, Bristol, um, have been receptive to that. Also, in, t in turning up physically to the one in Tayside, um, I always found to be very, very helpful. Thank you. All right.